Good morning, Crosswind Church. How's everybody this morning? Good. Everybody awake? My name is Bentley. I'm a home group leader here at Crosswind Church, and we're so glad. Whether you're watching online or you're here with us today, we're so glad you decided to join us today. If you're a first-time visitor, we want to say a special welcome, and we'd invite you to stop by the Welcome Center on your way out, where our volunteers are ready to greet you, and they have a gift for you. So check that out on your way out today. For those of you who are new to Crosswind, there's three things that I want you to know about. One, Crosswind Kids is open for babies through fifth grade. So you can find Crosswind Kids by going down the orange hallway on your right, where we have volunteers that are waiting to greet your child. We have a mom room. So back in this corner, if you're, a, if you're a mom and you're keeping your baby close, that's great. But if you find that you need some additional privacy during the service, you can check out our mom room. We have rockers and monitors so you won't miss anything. And then third, we have the starting point room back in this corner. So at the end of the service today, if you have a question about something you hear, if you uh, want to pray with someone, or if you want to talk about taking your next step in your faith journey, uh, meet, uh, meet us in the starting point room back in this corner. There are three easy ways to give here at Crosswind Church. You can use the Crosswind Church app, the Crosswind Church website, or the boxes in the back of the auditorium. We are so glad that you decided to join us here today. Please stand and join us for worship. everybody doing? All right. Good morning. How's everybody doing? I think I caught everybody by surprise. <laughs> Join with us this morning. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. As he opened the prison doors, and he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is sure in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now 
now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Lift it up, church. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. And our God is sure in this place. We won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, 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 we shout out your praise. Give praise. Thank you. When I'm walking through the valley your presence is around me as nothing stands between me and my God and the fear that was my prison is no longer where I'm living cause nothing stands between me and my God there's no place I go that he is not where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We'll be dancing through the darkness, cause we believe it. And every stronghold has to break at the name of Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. When the ground below is shaking, my joy can now be taken. Cause nothing stands between me and my God. So I'm looking to Jesus through a veil that's torn to pieces. Cause nothing stands between me and my God. No, oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We'll be dancing to the darkness Cause we believe it Every stronghold has to break At the name of Jesus Where the Spirit of the Lord is There's freedom Watch the lies break off Watch the enemy flee Watch the walls come crumbling down when the people of God sing. And the heavenly roar of every heart set free. Hear the chains of shame hit the ground when the people of God sing. Watch the lies break off. Watch the enemy flee. Watch the walls of crumbling down when the people of God sing. Hear the heavenly roar of every heart set free. Hear the chains of shame hit the ground when the people of God sing. 
where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We'll be dancing through the darkness, cause we believe it. And every stronghold has to break in the name of Jesus, where the Spirit of the Lord is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We'll be dancing through the darkness, cause we believe it. And every stronghold has to break in the name of Jesus. Oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. thankful for that this morning that we get to gather corporately as brothers and sisters and lift up the name of our Lord this morning I want to ask something of you this morning if we could just visualize our hands on our eyes to block out anything around us any distractions that have taken place this week, this morning, a minute ago, and just set our eyes, set our hearts and our spirit on engaging with the Lord this morning and ask Him to renew, refresh, and revive our relationship this morning. Join with us this morning. Restore in me the joy of my salvation. Take me back to where it all began. Where all I ever wanted was your presence. How I long to be there once again. Light a fire that the world can't burn out, fan the flame. Till nothing between us remains. My life is an altar to you. Breathe again. On the embers that burn in my heart Love taken back to the start My life is an altar to you You and me, a pure and willing spirit Take me back to where it all began Before it all became so complicated How I long to see there once again Out of fire Burn out fan of flame Till nothing between us remains My life is an altar to you Breathe again On the embers that burn in my heart Love taken back to the stars is an altar to you. God, I'm sorry 
Please forgive me. Oh, when I've gone through, Lord, I need you. How I need you to. Remains. My life is an altar to you. Oh, breathe again. All the embers that burn in my heart. Love taken back to the start. My life is an altar to you. is an altar to you. Let's proclaim that this morning. Lord, my life is an altar to you. Lord, my life is an altar to you. And all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing sing great on you all the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing sing great Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, sing great are you Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. thank you so much so much for this opportunity that you've given us Lord that we would gather in this house this morning Lord Lord that we would worship you Lord for the very breath in our lungs we give you praise we give you thanks I ask for this morning to receive this worship I pray that it has pleased you Father, go before Pastor Jeremy as he brings forth the word. I pray, God, you would just anoint him for this hour, Lord, and give us ears to hear you, hearts to truly understand. We pray this in the wonderful and the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.
So this last week, I, um, I got to thinking about milk. Am I the only one? Probably, yeah. There's, it's not quite as random when I tell you why. So, so last week, uh, Jody and I got an opportunity to go back to the National Institutes of Health where I'd, I had my bone marrow transplant that saved my life and all of those things and got to see all of those doctors and they ran this barrage of, these barrage of tests. It was a great visit. And then uh, this week... We had a, uh, I had a telehealth uh, appointment with those same doctors where they kind of went over some of the results. They were waiting on some of the results to come back. And uh, everything was fine. Everything was good. Um, and then they said, uh, but we have found uh, that you have some, some signs of osteoporosis, which is, which is like a degenerative bone thing. And so they said, do you drink milk? And I was like, well, no. Um, I don't, and I, maybe you should start. And so I started thinking about milk. Gr- growing up, um, we had 2% milk growing up. That was what I, I, I drank as a little boy, except for a period of time when we were in high school. When I was in high school, um, the doctors were concerned that I wasn't putting on weight, and so they made us switch to whole milk. And so for, for basically my high school career, I, I drank whole milk. And, and then I got married, and, and when you get married, there's compromises and there's things that you have to kind of kind of like, you know, give and take on a little bit. And uh, my wife's family, Jody's family, had always done skim milk, which really isn't milk. It's just water that's lying about being milk. And, um, and, and, and so, but that's okay. I, I, it wasn't a hill on which I was going to die. And so uh, we, got, we got skim milk, and that's what we've used in our house kind of, kind of moving forward. Uh, it's, it's, it's what we used to have until we found out there were other types of milk. And, and this was brand new to me until just a few years ago. So like you can make milk out of, out of all kinds of things, right? Like you, that there's soy milk. And so for people that have like lactose problems, I'm so thankful that we have things like soy milk because it means that they get to, but, but, but the reality is it's just, it's, it's, the reality is it's not milk. Like you can't milk a soybean, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not, it's not milk. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but that's not what it is. Then there's almond milk, Right, and there's there's almond milk that you can have unless you have like a nut allergy, and then you can't have almond milk. But 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 basically, I looked up how you make. You can make it in your house. You can make almonds. Just get almonds and and grind them up with water, and boom, you have almond milk. Well, that's not that's almond water is what that is. It's not milk, right? It, it may be white. And, it, and it, you can add some flavoring to it and kind of make it sweeter or make it taste a little bit more like milk, but it ain't milk. You know what I'm talking about? You, you, can, have, you can have soy milk, you can have almond milk, you have rice milk, coconut milk. You, you can make milk out of, I, I don't know, I'm assuming you can make milk out of just about everything uh, that exists, uh, that, that's some kind of plant. But the reality is, America, is that we've been lying to ourselves when we put the word milk on that carton. It ain't milk. You can call it whatever it is you want to call it, but, 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 but it didn't it didn't milk at the end of the day. And, 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 and the reality is, you start kind of thinking about it, we do this all the time in so many other areas of life where we call something something that it really isn't, right? And so, so like, I was thinking about it, you, you know that the, the, when you get a pencil, like a number two pencil to take a, a paper with, we say that that is a lead pencil, because historically graphite and lead have been confused with one another. That isn't lead in there, right? That's graphite, but we call it lead. We can call it whatever you want to call it, but it's still graphite, right? You, you, you understand that. Like, like you can take any vegetable and shape it into a meat patty. It ain't a hamburger, <laughs> Like, it's not. You, you, can, you can make it look like a chicken or a meatloaf or whatever it is. What, what I always want to know is where's the opposite, right? Where, where are, the, where are the, 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 the meat eaters that are shaping meat to look like broccoli? And, and I, that, I want to be a part of that group, right? But you, you can call it whatever it is that you want to call it. And, and at the end of the day, uh, it, it just isn't that thing. And as we move forward in our summer in the Psalms, today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture. We're going to look at a psalm that actually is, is, is almost the mirror image. It's almost a duplicate of another psalm that came earlier. And so to me, what that means is it was so important that the psalmists felt like they needed to put it in there twice. 
and, and, and they stick it in there. And, and, and as we go through it today, what I want to encourage you to do, in fact, if you're here today, you're watching online, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what I would like for you to do today as we, as we move through this is I want you to kind of take what it is that David is saying to us and I want you to internalize it and kind of be retrospective about it. Kind of like the last song that we just sang, right? This, this idea that, God, I want you to take me back to where it first started. Take me back to the beginning. And in those times when, when, I've, when I've strayed away from that, God, I'm sorry and forgive me and bring me back. Because, because in this psalm, we're going to see uh, that that there's a group of individuals that, that, that claim one thing but, but do something else. And as I, as I read through this in the last couple of weeks and I was prepared for today, it was something that was so incredibly convicting to me and I think that it can be to you as well if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if we allow it to penetrate our hearts. Now, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're watching online, you just came across our feed on Facebook, right? And, and, and you don't know about that whole Jesus thing. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today may be the reason that you've pushed away from the church. It may be the reason that you've pushed away from God. And if that's the case, I'm gonna invite you back at the very end. But while we're talking about this, I want you to just sit silently and pass judgment on all of us Christians because this is an area where we miss the boat so many times. So we're going to be in Psalm 53 today, and, uh, and we're going to hang out there, uh, although I'm going to read a number of other passages. You can turn there in your Bible. The words are going to be on the screen. Go there on your smartphone, uh, whatever it is, uh, so you can follow along with us. Psalm 53, and, uh, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time in verse 1. Uh, verse 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Pause. Now, when we think about people that claim there are no God, or there is no God. We think about people that, that we would call atheists who, who, who disagree. And we think about like the, the famous atheists, like Chris Hitchens, you know, or Richard Dawkins, um, or Stephen Hawking, some of these guys uh, that, that profess that, that God doesn't exist, have written books about it. God is not great, for one, the God delusion for another. Uh, you could just kind of go on, these, these people that, that we think about. But in reality, there's another group of people uh, that, that, that operate as atheists that, that I kind of want to spend some time talking about today. And in, in fact, as we look out into society, we see just the depravity and the sinfulness that exists every day. Uh, one of the first things that I do is I pull up my computer and I go and I read the news. And, and every day, you, you, you just see some of these things that you read about in Scripture. I'll tell you, just, we'll read some in just a minute. Just kind of playing out how, how people feel like that they're, they're growing wise and, and they feel like they're getting smart and really they're just becoming a fool. Paul would put it this way in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 22. It says, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, for God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, to the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. He goes, look, 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 look. When we look out in the world, we see people that think they're getting it all together. They think they're smart and they've made their little false gods. And they worship, they worship things like, like their wealth or their job. They, they, they worship things like the relationships that they're in in the world. They, they, they worship things like their possessions. They, they worship things like, like, like the, the latest political movement that's going on or the latest celebrity that's there. They, 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 they worship these created things and they think that they're getting so smart. They think they're getting so wise, but they're just becoming a fool. And look what it says. It said, therefore, because of this, God, whew, this ought to give every believer a shudder. God gave them over to their sinful desires. He said, that's what you want, fine. You can have it. And as we look out into the world, we see just this, this downward kind of spiral, and we see the rise of a group of individuals that, that maybe you've heard about, a group of individuals that we call the nuns, right? Not like the ones that wear a habit and go to a convent, 
but the nuns. These are the individuals that check on their, um, on their uh, census form when it comes to religious affiliation. They, they check none of these. And just, just to kind of give you some perspective on this, and I know we've talked about this, and I don't want to bore you with all the stats, but it, it, the good news is in the United States of America, 67% of Americans identify as Christian, which is great until you realize that in the last decade, that number has gone down 15%. And individuals that identify as nuns are 25% of the population, one out of every four. And that sounds like a low number until you realize that it's gone up 9% in the last decade. We're, we're seeing this trend kind of, kind of moving in broader society. And, and it gets worse when we start talking about the youngest generations. You hear us talk about 18 to 29-year-olds all the time. 18 to 29-year-olds um, are experiencing this in, in ways that no other generation is. What we know is that 64% about, somewhere literally between 60 and 80%, but 64% is the latest number I found, of, of individuals that grew up in church. These are your teenagers that are sitting next to you right now, the kids over in Crosswind Kids, the one that come to CWSM. 64% will drop out of church at some point in their life. Some of them come back, some of them don't. But when George Barna, who, who is a Christian guy that kind of does these, these polls and, and, and kind of tries to figure things out, when he did the study, he found out that, that 20, 22% of individuals that were raised in church will walk away and never come back, 22%. 30% of those individuals will identify as Christian. However, they have not been a part of any Christian community, participated in any Christian activities, or followed any kind of pursuit of Christ in the last six months. 38% attend church at least monthly, but hold no, to, no, no core beliefs of Christianity. They, they don't necessarily affirm the authority of Scripture or the resurrection of Jesus. They just, profess to be Je they just profess to be Jesus' followers and show up. These are the individuals that we call the, the box checkers. They're the ones that feel like if I show up at church or put some money in the plate every now and then and tip and bribe God that I'm just going to kind of be okay. 38% of the people that grew up in church end up there, and only 10% only 10% of individuals are church attenders that attend once a month and have a desire to become more like Christ, who, who adhere to the tenets of Scripture and who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and are willing to try to change broader society because of Jesus in their life. 10%. What that tells us is that 68% or so of people that profess to be Christian are what we call nominal Christians, meaning Christians in name only. They profess to be Christians, and yet they don't follow any of the tenets of Christians. We're going to give them a different title today. We're going to call them practical atheists. They claim that there's a God, but in their heart they deny that he exists. That they're nothing new in our society. Paul mentioned them to Titus. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, he says, They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. These are individuals, watch, that profess the name of Jesus Christ, even show up sometimes in our services. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're here now. Maybe it's you. And then you walk out the door and you remain unchanged by what it is that Jesus has supposedly done in your life. And although, although you profess that there's a God, you live your life as if he doesn't exist. You are a practical atheist. We, we call it a hypocrite in our society, right? Right? And in fact, we are such a hypocritical society. This is not just a religious thing. We do this all the time, where we say we believe one thing, but our actions cause us to do something else. We say that we believe something, but, but, but the way we act shows that we really don't believe it. I mean, I, I, you just can do a, a simple Google search uh, at the number of celebrities that are, that are uh, you know, pro, let's save the planet, right? Leonardo DiCaprio, for instance, really got raked over the coals for this because he's big into let's save the planet and, and let's be green and let's... Let's you know, make sure that we reduce our carbon footprint and all those things are good. And then he hops on his private jet and his private yacht and burns all of the gas to go do all of the things that he likes to do. And, and, and broader societies have been like, he's a hypocrite, right? 
right? Anthony Weiner, the, 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 the politician that, that you know, was lobbying for more transparency and, and for more integrity in the government system and then sends nude photos of himself to some of his staffers, right? I mean, you know that guy? How about COVID-19? When COVID-19 hit and we saw all of the people that were trying, and listen, it was a confusing, confusing time, but it was so frustrating, wasn't it, to hear people say one thing and then do something else? to tell you that this is what you're supposed to do and then, and then they didn't do it when the time came and it was all throughout society. We are such a hypocritical society. And, what, and what, what, what David wants us to get at is the fool says in his heart that there is no God. But I'm gonna go the next further. I think it's even a bigger fool that claims that there is a God and then lives like he doesn't exist because if you believe that there's a God and you believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and you believe that God will reward the righteous and punish the wicked, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do what he asks of you? It's beyond foolishness. And it's not not ignorance. You you guys know the difference in ignorance and stupidity. Ignorance means I just don't know any better. Ignorance is something that a child does because they they haven't touched the hot burner on the stove yet, right? They're they're ignorant of what it will do to them. Stupidity is they know it'll burn them and they touch them anyway. This is is willful disobedience. This isn't just a mistake that people are making. This is is what, what David is getting at is these people are intentionally denying the existence of God even though they know they, he exists. Fool says in her heart that there is no God. He continues on and he says, they are corrupt and all of their ways are vile. This, this word corrupt means rotten. It, it, it means, uh, you know, d- d- decaying. Um, I don't like guacamole. And I know that, that puts me in a minority, and that's, and that's okay. But the reason that I don't like guacamole is when I was in college uh, as a biology major, um, we were learning about fruits and nuts and those sorts of things. And our professor brought in an avocado uh, and and he was going to cut it open and show us the pit and the flesh and he was going to talk us through all of that. And when he opened up the avocado, it was absolutely rotten on the inside. It was nasty. It was black and it smelled bad. And I was just like, yeah, I don't ever have any desire to eat something like that ever. And and I understand those of you that like guacamole, don't send me your guacamole, I'm I'm not gonna eat it, right? But, But it was just so incredibly rotten. And the thing was, on the outside, it looked so good, but on the inside, it was rotten. And what David is getting at is these individuals that are denying the existence of God, they may check the box. They may show up at church on Sunday. They may go to the church down the street or go on the mission trip or go to the home group or whatever it is. But on the inside, they are rotting away. It says all of their ways are vile. The the word is detestable. The word is deplorable. The, The things that they do, it means that their sin infects other people. That, that their behavior is going to kind of get out into broader society and cause society to be worse off because they're in it. You've heard the, the, the saying that a bad apple destroys the whole bunch. You, you know, this is, this is legit, those of you that are botanists, biologists, right? The, the apple that, that starts to rot or gets a little bit of a bruise, it, it releases ethylene. And that ethylene causes all of the other fruit around it to begin to ripen and to rot around it. So literally, one bad apple can destroy an entire bunch of apples. It happens with all sorts of fruit. And the reality is, is we know this. When we are vile and corrupt on the inside, when when there's things that are hidden in our lives, sins that we keep from other people, it has a way of of, of, of permeating out into kind of the rest of society, into the people that are around us. I, I like to listen to, to true crime podcasts, right, all the time. And it's easy for us to recognize this when someone commits a heinous crime like murder or, or some kind of violent crime. We go, yeah, that affects the community and that affects the family for decades and maybe even generations to come. But, but do you realize that the lie you told affects the people that are around you? That that corner that you cut at work, it's, it's going to affect other people's lives. The way that you treat Your husband, the way that you you treat your spouse, your kids are going to see that and it's going to affect what they think a marriage should look like. Come on. The things that we blow past every day that that, that we don't even recognize as sin 
anymore, right? The, every sin affects someone else. David says that all their ways are corrupt. All their ways are vile. He finishes up in verse 1. He says, there is no one that, who does good. God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. This, the, the fact that he adds the not even one makes it kind of a, a superlative. It makes it emphatic. It's, there's no one that is righteous. No, not one. I'm reminded when I read this of, of when God looked down from heaven in Genesis 6 and Noah was there and, and he said, all of the ways of men, are, all of their hearts are inclined to evil all the time. Paul would put it this way. He would say in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not you, not me. There is no one that is good, not you, not me. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sometimes people will ask me, Jeremy, why is it that bad things happen to good people? And every time they ask me that question, I, I, I have to resist the urge to just say, well, because there are no good people. There are no good people. There is no one righteous. Last week, Chase said it so well when he was going through Psalm 51. He, he said that we're all broken. All of us. That, 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 that inside of us is a hard wiring for evil. Every single one of us have it. All of our children have it. All of our grandparents have it. It's, 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 it's this propensity to, to, to not do the right thing, to do something that is wrong. And here's the, the, the message from last week. I thought it was so good that Jesus meets us in our brokenness and he puts us back together. Praise God. He meets us in our brokenness and he puts us back together. But he asks us to change. You remember the story in John chapter 8? The woman caught in adultery. He says, where are your accusers? He says, they're not here. He said, neither do I accuse you, but now go and sin no more. Your sin is destroying you. And so you have to walk away from that. You have to be different than you were before. But we are all broken. There's not one of us that is righteous. And as I was reading this this week, let me, let me tell you how, how God began to kind of convict me. You see, when I read this and I read about those people that claim that there are no God, and I, I read about the people that, that are practical atheists that live as if there's no God, I think about those people. But then I come to this verse and it says that, that even I, even I am wicked. And it's causing me to, to take a look at my life. And, and, and followers of Jesus, I want you to look at your life as well and go, where is it that I'm living my life as if God doesn't exist? Where is it that I'm pushing him to the side? What are the sins that I'm harboring in my life? The jealousy, the anger, the rage, the bitterness, the unforgiveness. Where, where is it that I am the individual that professes that I believe in God but lives as if he doesn't exist? David has some harsh things to say about him in verse four. It said, do all these evil doers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on God. There's a cultural thing that we miss here. He said, they devour their people like eating bread. What this means is, is it's something that they've just grown accustomed to. Just like eating bread was something they did every day. They didn't think about it, right? It was just a part of their diet. It was something they did every day. That, that sin becomes so uh, egregious in our lives. We become so accustomed to sin that, that we don't even recognize it as sin anymore. We, we don't even recognize it as something that, that, that pushes us away from our heavenly Father, right? And, and you don't have to, to think very hard about it to recognize that things that were once deplorable in our society now have become not just accepted but celebrated, right? We, we don't have to go back that far. Um, to, to, to give you my age just a little bit, and I, I risk being called a, a, a fuddy-duddy here, and, and that's okay. I'm not, right? Um, in, in, in 1989, um, an album came out uh, by a band named Two Live Crew. They were a rap, a rap group. And, and Two Live Crew, yeah, you're chuckling because y'all had it. Don't <laughs> listen. The album was called As Nasty As I Want to Be, okay? 
And, and it was just, it, you know, I, I, I got to be honest with you, I, I, I haven't listened to the whole album, but, but from what I understand, it was just filled with explicatives and sexual innuendo, and, and it was just, it was just, it was nasty. The, the album was called As Nasty As It Want To Be. It was so bad, I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up, it was so bad that it was actually banned to be sold and, and there were people that were arrested, like record store um, uh, uh, proprietors, that were arrested for selling this album uh, because it was, it was uh, uh, you know, legislation was passed that it was obscene and, and shouldn't be sold or listened to by anyone. Now, eventually, that was kind of overturned, and we saw some of the free speech movement in the 90s come forward um, and those sorts of things. And so, as I was thinking through this this last week, I thought, I, I wonder just how bad that was. I, could, I couldn't remember how bad the title track of the song was, right? They're, they're, I can't even tell you the name of the song. It's, it's kind of vulgar. But, but like, like it, you know, what, what were the words of that song? And so, I, I looked up the lyrics to the song and read them. And, and yes, there were explicatives in it, and yes, there was sexual innuendo in it, but compared to some of the things that I've heard at our children's dances, it, it was tame. Like, it was very tame. And I thought, oh my goodness, something that was so, so frowned upon in 1989, something that, that got banned, people were arrested because it was so vulgar, now wouldn't even, wouldn't even, be a blip on the radar to some of the things that are going on. And come on, we know this. It's not just in music, but it's everywhere. It's things that were once unheard of now become commonplace. And that's the way sin works. Sin, sin works in such a way that, that, that we do it once and we feel a little bit of guilt and we do it again and we feel a little less guilt and eventually, as Paul says in Romans, God hands us over to our sin and we no longer feel the conviction that we once felt because of what it is that we're doing to rebel against God and his ways. I'm telling you, it is, it, is, it is happening all around us. It happens in my heart, it happens in your heart, and it's nothing new. Jeremiah would say it this way. He said that the sin of Judah is written on their hearts with an iron pen with a diamond tip. It has been etched into who they are, so much so that they no longer even recognize it. David says, they devour your people, God, like eating bread. It's, it's like nothing to them. They, they don't even think about it as sin anymore. Verse five, he says, but there they are, overwhelmed with dread, where there was nothing to dread. God scattered the bones of those who attacked you and put them to shame, for God, you despised them. He says, but listen, in spite of the fact that they're sinning, that, that they're, they're still afraid of, of, of the judgment of God. And they ought not be, right? Because if they would just submit to your holiness, if they would just submit to your love, then they would have no reason to fear. But yet they're afraid because, God, you are going to judge the wicked. See, I, I think a lot of times we see the pendulum in Christianity kind of swing and, 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 and from one side to the other, and, and we have so emphasized, and, and, and with good reason, the love and the forgiveness of God. I, I think that's so incredibly important. But you cannot, watch this, important, you cannot separate God's love and forgiveness from his holiness and his justice. You cannot cannot separate God's love and forgiveness from his holiness and justice. God is slow to anger and abounding in love, but he will not take kindly to individuals that profess he exists and then live their life as if he doesn't. He, he will not do it. He will punish the wicked and he will reward the righteous. And so the question that, that you have to answer, Christian, follower of Jesus, the question you have to answer is, which side are you on? Are you on the reward side or are you on the punishment side? Where, where will you be? This spans even more than just salvation in Jesus Christ. This is about the rewarding of the righteous and the punishment of the wicked. But make no mistake about it, we cannot separate those two. John would, would, would say it so well in his letter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, when he says, if we claim to have fellowship with him 
and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. What, what, what he's saying is, is, hey, if we profess to have a relationship with God and we continue to live as if he doesn't exist, we're liars. David would say, you're a fool. You're fooling yourself. You are lying to yourself. But if you are willing to pursue righteousness, if you are willing to go to war with sin, if you are willing to put away those things that encumber you and keep you from being more Christ-like, then look how David ends the psalm on such a good note. Verse six, it says, oh, that the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. (laughs) He says, Listen, for those that are going to pursue righteousness, for those that are willing to live their life transformed by the gospel, that are willing to to live as if God is present in their life on a daily basis, if if they're willing to do that, then, then God will restore them. In this world, Jesus would say, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And he will make right what our enemies have made wrong. He will make right what sin has destroyed in our lives and the lives of everyone else. So here's the question that I want us to answer. Here's the question as we move forward. And this may be the most important question that you ask yourself. Certainly it will be today. Am I lying to myself? Am I a liar? Am I a fool? Am I one of these individuals that just checks the box off on Sunday? I show up and I sit in a row, but but my life, when I go to work, it, 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 it doesn't look any different than anybody else's, right? The language that I use, the jokes that I tell, the activities that I engage in, the way I treat my spouse, the way that I deal with my kids, the way that I talk to my parents, the way that, that I sit in a classroom and, 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 and talk to my teachers and respect my teachers or the way that I, that I teach my students and lead them, am I, am I truly reflecting the gospel that saved me? Am I truly pursuing Christ's likeness? Because if you want to know whether or not you, you are following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, don't ask yourself the question, did I show up at church on Sunday? Ask your question, how is it that I interacted with so many other people? How is it that I lived my life when I walked out of the door on Sunday morning? Because I'm absolutely convinced if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe the thing that pushed you away are believers that acknowledged Jesus with their lips and then walked out the door and denied him with their lifestyle. That is what, this is not my words, this is from DC Talk. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. They just can't get it. If God really does exist, then why hasn't he changed the way that you live? So are you fooling yourself? Are you lying to yourself? When you go to work, how do you do do your job? Do you do it as if you're doing it to the Lord? When you drive down the road, what are the thoughts that are going through your brain and your head? How is it that you treat your neighbor? You see, you cannot separate God's love and forgiveness from his holiness and his justice. He is both. And the righteous will be rewarded and the wicked will be punished. The question is, which side are you on? If you're a believer today, you owe it to yourself to ask yourself the question, am I? I lying to myself? Am I just putting on a face, checking a box? Am I one of these 68% of people (laughs) that professes Christ but lives as if he doesn't exist? Am I a practical atheist in the way I handle my money, in the way I handle my stuff, in the way I treat my body? Am I lying to myself? myself. If you're here today, you're watching online and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ and maybe this is something where you're going, yeah preacher, I can finally agree with something you said. 
right? And you've been silently passing judgment on us for the last 30 minutes, and I'm so thankful that you did. I'm so thankful that you're here. If you've rejected Jesus Christ, if you're here in the building or watching and you've rejected Jesus Christ because of hypocritical Christians, first of all, I'm sorry. And do not, do not push away from Jesus because his followers haven't reflected him well. Because he's so much better than that. He's so much better than that. In just a minute, we're going to pray and we're going to dismiss. And as Bentley said earlier, our starting point room is open for those of you that may just want an opportunity to pray with somebody, to redirect, to refocus. To, to, to maybe you just want to spend some time on your own uh, in your seat after the service, just praying that God would, would reveal to you those areas where you've been living like a practical atheist, where you've been professing Christ with your mouth but denying him with your lifestyle. And maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, you can pull into that 10% that wants to see their lives transformed, want to see society transformed, because they believe with every ounce of their being that life with Jesus is better. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to begin the conversation with some of us. Drop us a note online, come to the starting point room, come find me after the service, and let's talk about what it looks like. What it looks like to follow Jesus. Not just check a box, not just show up at church and kind of go through the motions so that everyone thinks that we're good, but has a transformative relationship with the King of Kings who has hung the stars in the sky and knows you by name. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for our time here together today. Thank you for the words of David and how they challenged us and how they're echoed in the New Testament. God, I I pray that you would help us to see the things inside of us that, that draw us away from you and that draw others away from you. Those parts that are corrupt or that are vile or detestable. Those times when we, when we profess that we love you and we profess that we know you and we profess that you exist, but we operate as if you don't. God, forgive us for those times and redirect us. And for those individuals that have pushed away from you and pushed away from the faith and pushed away from Jesus because of Christians who, who, who just have, have been hypocritical. God, I, I pray that they would give you another chance. I pray that they would give us another chance to see what it looks like to follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Give them the courage to know what to do and the wisdom to do it, no matter what that may be, no matter what it may cost. We love you, we trust you, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next week.